He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. Y'all look so pretty today. It's like a bright, vibrant garden in here. And uh, y'all dressed up, clean up nice. We're glad that you're here. I want to welcome each and every one of you to Quaker Gap Baptist Church for our time of worship on this Resurrection Sunday. If you are a guest with us for the first time, uh, would you do us a favor of just filling out this little tear-off section in our bullets and let us know who you are? You can drop that in the offering box on your way out, uh, and we'd love to just get to know who you are. We're glad that you're here today. Also, if you have a prayer request for us, you can write it down on the bottom of that same slip of paper, drop it in our offering box, and we will be in prayer for these needs throughout the week. So we are glad to see each and every one of you here today. There are a few announcements to make, so if you have your bulletin, look at the center portion along with me. I just want to point out some things to you. Tuesday, 6 a.m., men are invited to P.B. Clark's and King for our men's breakfast Bible study. This Wednesday evening, we are having an eat-in meal at 6 o'clock p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. We're having spaghetti, salad, bread, and dessert. And if you plan on eating with us, you need to fill out this little tear-off section and drop that in one of the offering boxes or call by noon tomorrow to the church office. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if you look down the center portion of your bulletin, that uh, the, all those Wednesday evening activities are available to you following the meal. Whether you decide to eat with us or not, you can come join us for those activities beginning at 7 o'clock. The Women Warriors have a meeting this week at 6.30 p.m. at the home of Beth James. Information should be about that on the back of the bulletin, and uh, you can call if you have any questions. Uh, in addition to that, um, I just want to remind you that we are uh, continuing to get ready for our um, new church directory, and so uh, make sure that you uh, reserve a time uh, by using these, these little doohickeys on here. See, I'm not as good at Meredith as this. These little doohickeys on here, you know, you take a picture of it, click on the link, and next thing you know, uh, you are in and able to reserve a spot to come have your picture taken either indoors or outdoors, and we want to get just as many of our members and regular attenders and whoever wants to come and have their picture taken, we'd love to have you. So uh, make sure that you, you uh, get ready for that. In addition to that, this uh, is probably the last Sunday for us to take up the Annie Armstrong uh, missions offering for North American Mission Board. There are envelopes there in your pew, and you can drop that in the offering box, and we'll make sure that uh, that gets to the Annie Armstrong offering for uh, North American Mission Board. Uh, also, I want to just let you know that we uh, have about 200, 250 maybe at the most bales of pine needles left in our trailer. So we're almost done, and if you need some pine straw, please let us know, because it's not going to be long, we're going to call and have that uh, trailer taken away. So uh, this is a last call for pine straw, and I uh, hope that uh, you'll let us know, and uh, I can come meet you out there at the trailer, just make arrangements with me, doesn't have to be on Saturday, just get it before it's gone. So, uh, so happy to see each and every one of you, and uh, so glad to be able to Give good news this morning. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we welcome your presence with us today. We just look forward to lifting our voices in song and remembering who you are and what you've done for us. Father, use this time to inspire us, to encourage us, to comfort us. Lord, mostly that our eyes would be focused on our Savior, Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Son of God. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we read from his word <clears throat> from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Let's sing together. Low in the grave he lay, and then shortly after that, majesty.
scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. If you would like to turn in your pew Bible, it's on page 768. Also, it appears on the top of uh, the second page of your bulletin if you'd like to follow along from there. John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. But Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, how grateful we are for all that our Savior Jesus has done for us. His willingness to go to the cross and take our sins upon himself and die there in our place. We're grateful for the sacrifice that he made because we know that without it, our sins could not be forgiven. And we are also grateful this morning for the empty tomb because we know that there is no eternal life apart from a living Savior. So Lord, we are grateful today for the truths that we rehearse this time of the year, but the truths that are good news throughout the year. Lord, we want to pray for those who are in need in our congregation those who are ill, those who are uh, undergoing treatments, those who have been hospitalized, have had recent surgeries. Father, those who are just under the weather, we lift them all up to you, Father, and pray for your hand of healing and encouragement upon them. Lord, be their comfort through this time. Give them strength. Give them hope. Father, we also want to uh, pray for those who are serving you around this world, for those who are missionaries, separated from their families and their homes, but sharing the gospel of Christ. We want to pray for our sister churches throughout the world as the gospel of Jesus Christ is being uh, preached and broadcast and disseminated today. Lord, I pray that people's hearts would be changed. And Father, even here at Quaker Gap, Lord, as we have opportunity to share the good news, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, bring us encouragement, comfort, and Lord, give us hope, remind us of the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love that you have for us. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Shine with 
story, God, you entered in and became one of us. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah for the things he has done. the first time in your life that you truly encountered the reality of death. I was six years old. I remember sensing that there was something happening in my house. I didn't know what. Wasn't sure what it was. My mother was in her bedroom, on her bed, crying. My sister, who was three years older and wiser than I, told me, in very hushed tones, that mommy needs to be alone right now. And then she said, nanny died. Nanny was my grandmother, my mother's mother. And I knew that nanny had been sick. Years later, I learned that she had died of cancer. But I had seen her when she was sick. I had seen her when she was bedridden and living with one of my aunts. But the thought or even the understanding of death was the farthest thing from my mind. All I knew to do in those moments was to quietly enter my mother's room, climb up on the bed next to her, and just give her a little boy hug. And through her tears, she said to me, Nanny is in heaven. It didn't register with me that I would never see my nanny again in this life. Heaven is not a place you visit for a few days like a hospital. It's a place where you go and stay. It's a place where you don't wish to come home again. 
because you find yourself at home in heaven. Of course, I have encountered death many times since. I've been with families in hospice as their loved ones are passing away. I've been called to situations where someone has just passed away and they're waiting for the coroner to arrive. I've been at the emergency room where a family is grieving the loss, shockingly, of someone who was much too young. I have received phone calls late in the night knowing that it cannot be good news. I've tried to comfort a mother whose son had taken his own life. And never, never in any of those circumstances have I asked the question, why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? That's exactly the question that an angel asks Mary Magdalene at the tomb where she has gone to continue the process of preparing the body of her Lord for its final burial. And there are no embalmers in those days. Remember, the work was left to family and friends to accomplish. And so she was there on duty. Why are you weeping, Mary? It shouldn't be obvious. I mean, death is tragic. Death is sorrowful. Death is awful. Scripture tells us that death is an enemy a cruel enemy, and that there's no getting around it. Apart from some apocalyptic happenings, we all have a date with death. All of our loved ones have a date with death. Now, life is a miracle. It's a gift from God that we didn't have to pay for. We didn't even deserve it. We just appeared in this world, had nothing to do with our own life. It's a gift from our God. But as sinners who live in a world that is broken, these lives are temporary. And everything around us is in a state of decay. Even our own bodies. Why are you weeping, Mary? I don't think the angel's question was insensitive, though. I really believe the angel was preparing to give her some good news but wanted to give her an opportunity in those moments to just vent her feelings. Her sorrow, her frustration. The the angel never told her to stop crying. The angel doesn't say, stop crying, Mary. He simply asks, why are you weeping? And leaves an open-ended question for her to answer. And she chokes back her tears long enough to say, they have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they have put him. So now on top of death, she's dealing with grave robbers. And from her answer, it is obvious that she had never considered the possibility of a resurrection. That was something that she was not thinking about. Someone who is resurrected does not need anyone to put them anywhere. And she says, I don't know where they put him. Who knows what's going on in her mind? Maybe the religious leaders have taken her body, have taken the body of Jesus. Maybe the religious leaders want to desecrate his body, to shame him as if he hasn't been shamed enough already. Whatever the reason, it cannot be good. Nobody steals a dead body for good reasons. But then a figure she mistakes for a gardener appears. Makes sense that there would be a gardener in a garden. He stands before her. She doesn't know it's Jesus. Why would she think it was Jesus? So he also asks her the same question. Woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And she says to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. As we consider this story, there's a comforting truth that arises from Mary's encounter with the angel and with this gardener. And that is this, that God gets your grief. God gets your grief. What must Mary have felt as she approached the tomb and she saw that Jesus was not there? You know, forget her thoughts for a moment and think just about her feelings, her emotions. Concentrate on what she is experiencing. She's grieving the loss of her Lord, her mentor, her Savior, her friend. And now his body is taken away. John and Peter came to the tomb and they saw it was empty. And scripture says they believed, but it also says they went back to where they were staying. Generally speaking, I guess, men and women might grieve in diverse ways. You know, men process it internally, women emote externally. Neither the angel nor the gardener, the gardener, 
disparaged Mary for shedding tears. They didn't shame her. In fact, they were about to change her tears of sorrow to tears of overwhelming joy. But let's wallow in the weeping for just a moment here. God understands our grief. He created you with a full complement of emotions. And God hates death. He understands, and the proof is found in the experience of Jesus. Another Mary, Mary of Bethany, Mary the sister of Martha, came weeping to Jesus after the death of her brother Lazarus. And John tells this story. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? Ah, John eleven thirty five. 35, everybody's favorite Bible memory verse. <laughs> Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35. You learned a verse today. Here's a question for your Bible study group. Since Jesus knew he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead, why is he weeping? Jesus is about to call Lazarus forth from the tomb. He knows what's about to happen, but he's weeping. Why? Now, don't overthink it. He's not sad because of their lack of faith. The passage says why he wept. It's right there in the passage. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was also deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He saw their tears, and it evoked tears from him. Jesus understands the grief and the sorrow of death. Jesus experienced sorrow, so much so that we're told that he's called a man of sorrows. Not like Superman, a man of steel, but a man of sorrows. Another example comes from the Palm Sunday narrative. As we celebrated Palm Sunday last week, Jesus is riding down the Mount of Olives toward the city of Jerusalem, and he looks down on the hustling and bustling city and all the activities taking place there as people are preparing for Passover, kind of like going to Sam's house or Sam's club before Thanksgiving. It's just crazy in there. And Luke says, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it knowing that he's about to be rejected by his own people. It hits Jesus right in the fields. Can't you see what I have to offer you? Don't you know who I am? I am the Lord, the Messiah, come to save you. Why don't you come to me and find peace and salvation? He loves them deeply, but they have no room for him. Jesus understands our sadness. The writer of Hebrews says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. There's a difference between Jesus and us. We've been through weakness and temptation and trials and trouble in our lives, and we have not always passed the test. But Jesus always passed the test. Jesus experienced the full gamut of human emotions trials, temptations, life situations. He saw it all. He knew it all. He experienced it as a man in human skin. And that was for us because we think of God as being otherworldly and how he can't possibly relate to what we're going through. But God came as a human being and experienced everything that we experienced for our benefit so we would know that he gets us. That's right. The ad campaign Make of it what you will. What it says is true. He gets us. God gets us. And he gets our grief. Take comfort in knowing that our God understands our tears. He's given us his Holy Spirit to comfort us, to guide us in our times of sadness. He's given us the good news that brings beauty from ashes and hope from tears. That this is our God. Now, the tears of Mary did not last long. I find this story to be one of the most moving in all of Scripture. Because as she's explaining the reason for her tears, the gardener suddenly says her name. I love this passage of scripture. Jesus said to her, Mary, Mary. 
And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Perhaps that's the name that she called him on an everyday basis. One simple word, her name. It's all she had to hear. She knew it was him. The fog was cleared. The grief was overcome. The, the death, which is a powerful enemy, make no mistake about it, Jesus is more powerful than death. Our second observation is this. Christ defeats death. Christ defeats death. Think about that morning for Mary. The first thing she sees is a stone that's rolled away. She runs to Peter and John to tell them what's going on. She returns to the tomb crying. She encounters angels. She sees Jesus. Jesus tells her, do not hold on to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. She runs back to the place where Peter and John are staying. They must have thought to themselves, you again? What do you got now, Mary? John says, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Now put all the clues together. All of these clues, put them together. The stone is rolled away. The tomb is empty. There's angels in the tomb. Jesus speaks to Mary. And soon Jesus will show up for his disciples. Jesus is alive and death is defeated. That's the point of all this. Did the disciples understand the upshot of this? I mean, did they, were they able to ponder all the theological ramifications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Probably not. Not at that moment. What they did know is this. He said he would rise again. And he did. He rose again. Christ defeats death. Now years later, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul would clarify this for us by writing, Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? It's like saying, okay, death, you think you're so tough? We're going to plant a big L on your forehead. You think you're so good? You think you're the big shot? We're going to defeat you. The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's because of his resurrection that we have victory over death. Just as we've been seeing in Colossians, the death of Jesus is your death. You are crucified with Christ. The resurrection of Jesus is your resurrection. You are raised to new life in Christ. You are a new creature. He gives us victory over death because he defeated death for us. And there is hope for everyone who puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. He conquered death so that we might have life. Abundant life now, eternal life forever. I love the fact that Jesus knows where he's going. He knows where he's going, and he broadcasts it for everyone else to know. It began in 1987. The New York Giants had just won the Super Bowl. A film crew went down to the, fi the field, and they offered Phil Simms, the quarterback of the New York Giants, $75,000 and a free vacation to answer a simple question. Hey, Phil Sims, you've just won the Super Bowl. What are you going to do next? You know the answer, right? I'm going to Disney World. There's a list of athletes on Wikipedia that have said that phrase after winning championships. Tom Brady four times, Pat Mahomes three times. Nobody had to pay Jesus to say what he said. Nobody had to feed Jesus any lines. Hey, Jesus, you just rolled away the stone and rose from the grave. What are you going to do next? John 20, 17. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Forget Disney World. I'm going home to Daddy. And if I go to be with my Father, I will prepare a place for you. Resurrection has a way of changing your perspective, see? Death is no longer the enemy. Death is defeated. Now death, instead of being the enemy, is just a door into eternity. It makes all the difference in the world, folks. 
to realize that death is not the end for a believer in Jesus Christ. It is just the beginning of eternal life. Our third observation is faith faces the future. Faith faces the future. God gets your grief. Christ defeats death and faith faces the future. Grief is all about healing from the hurt of the past about dealing with loss in your own personal way. By faith, however, we become so fascinated with the future that the hurts of the past don't hurt so much. And eventually, they go away. Because our eyes are on the prize and our eyes are no longer on the past. There's a reason why so many funeral services use resurrection verses. It's because in those moments when we walk through the valley of death, we need a reason to look up. We need hope. And that hope is found in the empty tomb. Hope is found in the place that Jesus is preparing for you, in the Father's house. Hope is found in the risen Christ, seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Death is a devastating enemy. But Jesus is our victorious hero. In his vision of the end times, John saw the ultimate destiny of death. Revelation 20, 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. There's coming a day when death will be no more. Death will be destroyed. Death has been defeated in Christ at the empty tomb, but there's coming a day when death will ultimately be destroyed and there will be no more death as we spend eternity with him. In the here and now, however, we see in the example of Mary, some days we just mingle the grief with the joy. Have you been there before? <laughs> Mingling the grief with the joy. You can't even get a hold of your own emotions. Easter morning is a combination of sadness and joy. Christian writer Adam Thomas brings this, to, this fact to life. He draws a comparison with the Pixar movie Inside Out. Has anyone ever seen the movie Inside Out before? Here's how Adam describes it. He says, in Inside Out, we meet 11-year-old Riley who moves across the country at the start of the movie. The story is told by her five primary emotions, and the two main characters are joy and sadness. For most of the film, Joy, voiced by the irrepressible Amy Poehler, does everything in her power to steer Riley's emotions and keep sadness from touching the command console in Riley's mind. Joy has always been Riley's primary emotion, but Joy finds it harder and harder to help Riley, who misses her old home terribly. At the end of the movie, sadness finally gets a turn. And Riley, who's been putting on a brave face for her parents' sakes, breaks down crying in their arms. Joy understands that sometimes embracing sadness is the only way to confront the changes and the chances of our lives, but the movie doesn't end there. Next, joy and sadness both put their hands on the console, and they produce Riley's first mixed emotion, which rolls down the conveyor belt, a swirl of yellow and blue. There is sadness in Riley's longing for her old home and joy in the comfort of her parents' embrace. And in that moment, Riley matures in her emotional awareness. She laments and celebrates at the same time. Just like Mary Magdalene. Just like us on Easter Sunday. Just like us when we move from this room out to the cemetery and say goodbye to someone that we love. It is sadness mixed with joy for believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So why are you weeping today? What are you seeking amid your sorrows? You know, maybe you've lost a loved one, as Mary did. Or maybe your life is being threatened by some sort of illness. Or maybe you've just lost your joy Maybe there is tension in your marriage. Maybe there is difficulty with your children. Or maybe you just feel a dull pain. You know, a sense of loss. You don't know where it comes from. Anxiety. And you can't even put a finger on where that has come from. You don't know where that started, where it began, what it's all about. You just know that you feel it. So you weep. 
you weep. Why are you weeping? Why are you weeping? What causes you to weep today? Just as the risen Christ called Mary by name, he calls you by name. Can you hear the Lord say your name? Just as children recognize the voice of their parents, do we recognize the one who calls us by name? No, it's something when a baby's crying and you're doing everything you possibly can to try to comfort that baby. And mommy walks up and says one word and psst, it's done. Do we recognize the one who calls us by name? Because he is alive. There is hope for us in our grief, our confusion, our fear, and our anxiety. The living Savior is calling our attention away from our circumstances of life. Oh, we still got to deal with those circumstances, but he's calling our attention away from those circumstances. As alarming as they may be, he is calling our focus to him, to him. The one who suffered the most is the one who can truly identify with our sufferings because he lives. He can strengthen us. He can guide us. He can comfort us in our pain. He can give us peace and joy despite the circumstances of life. Come what may, if we seek the living Christ, that's where we find our joy. Jesus is the true gardener. You think about this. He created the Garden of Eden and he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. He is the true gardener. He's going to be there at the end of all creation when all things are renewed and in that beautiful city surrounded with gardens. And John's book of Revelation says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. No more weeping. One day the reality that it will be uh, of, the, of our life will become our lived experience, right? The things that we believe right now, our faith will become sight. We will understand it for what it is. But for now, it requires faith. I wish you a very happy resurrection day and I pray that the truth of the resurrection will sink down deep inside of you and take your tears away and that the faith that comes from our death-defeating Savior will cause you to fix your eyes on a future that is filled with hope. Whatever your struggle today, fix your eyes on Christ. Pin your hopes on Him alone. Raise Christ more, as we've been saying here at Quaker Gap. There are many other things you can do to find hope in this world. There's a lot of things you can turn to for comfort. But only Jesus comes with resurrection power. Job was one of the most troubled men on the face of the earth. Yet in spite of all of his loss, he was able to fix his eyes on the Lord to come. And he said, I know my Redeemer lives. And at the last, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. Job says, I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. Why? Because my Redeemer lives. We used to sing an old song. It goes like this. For I know my Redeemer lives, and in the end He will stand on the earth. For I know my Redeemer lives, and in the end He will reign on the earth. Lo, my flesh it be destroyed, yet with my eyes I will see God, for I know that my Redeemer lives, and I will stand with Him on that day. For I know that my Redeemer lives, 
and I will stand with him on that day. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you, O Lord, for all that you have done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. But Father, I know it's true that we need to embrace him for ourselves. That the crucifixion and the resurrection mean nothing unless we come by faith to Jesus Christ and receive his truth as our very own and take him as our Savior, repent of our sin and believe in him. So Lord, I pray that uh, you would personalize this in our hearts today. If there's one here today who has not trusted in Jesus for salvation, if there's anyone here who does not have that assurance, Lord, I pray that uh, they would make that decision now. That they would confess their sin and that they would trust in you, the crucified and risen one. And Father, I want to pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ here who have made that decision in their lives, Lord, that we would be able to preach that same gospel to ourselves day in and day out. Father, that that we would be reminded every day, no matter what this life brings, that this isn't all there is, that there's eternity with him. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to be servants of yours, that we would share the good news with others, that we would demonstrate love and hope to others through our lives, and, Lord, that you would be glorified through us. So, Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that you would inspire us by the resurrection of Jesus Christ to be people of life living in this world. Lord, we're grateful for the resurrection. We're grateful for the empty tomb. We're grateful for the tears of Mary, the tears of Jesus. We're grateful for all that it teaches us today. Help us, Lord, to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Easter. Hope you enjoy your day, the beauty of uh, the sunshine and the warm weather. So grateful to our God. Thank you for coming this morning. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we glorify you. We worship you. We pray, Father, that as we step forth from this place, that we, throughout our days, will be reminded of the message that we have heard. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, lives, and so do we. In his name we pray. Amen.